I'm Patricia Thornley and I'm based at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research which is within the School of Mechanical Aerospace and Civil Engineering at the University of Manchester. I'm also the director of the UK Supergen Bioenergy Hub. Now Tyndall Centre does climate change research and we do interdisciplinary research so we have people here who are engineers like me, people who are scientists, people who are economists, social scientists and the idea is that we bring all those different perspectives together to focus on climate change. And the work that I do on bioenergy is really quite similar because bioenergy involves taking a resource which is growing in the ground, absorb CO2 from the atmosphere as it grows, and then we convert it into an energy product. We return the CO2 back to the atmosphere. So in theory, we haven't made any net difference to the CO2 in the atmosphere and we have a sustainable energy system which can also deliver environmental benefits to soil and socio-economic benefits along the supply chain. In order to study that system you really need lots of interdisciplinary input um, from soil scientists through to engineers and economists and all sorts of different people who are involved and trying to work out what the net impact of the system is in different places around the globe. For, for students, yeah. Um, so we have a number of PhD students here who have a really diverse um, set of backgrounds. So one of my recently graduated PhD students was working on resource assessment. So he built a model which looked at how we trade off um, biomass resource with food production and with land use and how you look at population growth and combine all those things together to say actually how much of this stuff can we sustainably have. So he built a model that he's tested on some different countries to date and what we'd really like to do if we had new PhD students is look at trying to apply that model to different country contexts and look at where global flows of biomass might occur in the future. Another thing we're really, really interested in for PhD students is the prospects for bioenergy to deliver against sustainable development goals. So there are a number of, I think, 17 global sustainable development goals and energy access is one of those. Energy access is really important because it empowers people. Um, 1.2 billion people in the world don't have access to clean energy. And if you don't have that, then you can't get from A to B. In terms of mobility and transport, you can't sell your produce, you can't farm your fields, you can't provide light for people to read after it goes dark in the evening, you're limited in terms of education. There's all sorts of things that we take for granted that actually are not possible without access to energy. The problem is that the rate the population is growing, if we try to provide access to energy for everyone in the manner we've done it to date, the planet wouldn't be able to survive. So it's really important that we look at clean energy access. And what you find is that in many areas where population is growing most in the world, and I'm particularly thinking here of Southeast Asia and areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, you actually also have very rural communities where they don't have access to big infrastructure, but they do have access to biomass supplies from trees, from agricultural residues and from crops that they can grow that can also improve the soil fertility in the long term. So one of the things we're really interested in is looking at how bioenergy solutions can be integrated into different development contexts in Asia, Africa and South America in order to deliver against the sustainable development goals. So that's another one I'm particularly interested in. And probably the third area where some of my students um, are likely to find themselves working is in something totally different, in process modelling. Um, so in order to actually make a difference, you have to build something. You have to engineer it. And I worked for many years in the real world um, on combustion, as a combustion engineer on power plants, big power plants. So when we look at that, we need to be able to actually design processes that are efficient, that are environmentally benign, and that deliver what people want. So taking this biomass which comes in, it, it can be in all sorts of forms. It can have different physical, chemical, or all sorts of different properties that might give you problems with different conversion technologies. So you've got to really understand the feedstock, 
how to pre-process it, what you're going to do to it, are you going to get it there, how much have you lost along the way and how much energy have you expended and then we look at the conversion technologies. When we do that we've got to look at the impact, so what's the environmental impact to earth, to air, to water, along all of that and how much does it cost? So we do this using um, process modelling, we use a variety of different simulation tools and, and this is the sort of thing where we would be looking more for people with an engineering background or a numerical physical sciences background and then they can use some of the um, tools that we have here, different um, software tools that allow us to model different types of processes and see how those perform when we try them out with different feedstocks and then look at what the environmental impact of that is and how the whole life cycle of the thing from start to finish actually pans out. So those are probably the three main areas um, that students in my area would end up working. But other people in the Climate Change Centre here are also interested in much wider things. We do a lot of work on policy, so people with a policy interest, um, people who are interested in economics, that's something that we do a lot of work on. And we do a lot of work on public perceptions and the social science around um, energy use and climate change. Okay, so the Tyndall Centre is headquartered at the University of East Anglia, which is based in Norwich. And as I do this video recording, the director of Tyndall Centre from Norwich is actually on the other side of the corridor. That's Corinne the Queer. Um, but there are a number of different Tyndall centres up and down the country. Manchester is the second biggest after UEA and Manchester leads on energy. Traditionally we've also always led on the energy programme. So UEA do a lot of the climate modelling um, and Manchester does energy systems. So we tend to look at what the climate impact is of the energy system, how we can mitigate that impact by reducing the carbon emissions but also how we adapt. So how we in our lives can actually adapt to a future that will be warmer and how that warmer future will actually impact on the energy systems that are evolving. So how resilient are those systems moving forward? Do we have networks that can stand up to this? That sort of thing. Um, so Manchester leads on energy within Tyndall um, but also supports the other areas. So I, I'm going to have to really try hard to remember here. I think there are four pillars in Tyndall and we work on coasts and cities, we work on land and water, we work on energy and it's all themed around this mitigation adaptation agenda. Oh yes, Manchester and Supergen. So the Supergen Bioenergy Hub is led by Manchester, so a lot of the staff here um, are focused on that. In particular, the work that we need is, as you might guess from being in a climate change centre, is focused on the greenhouse gas balances of bioenergy systems. There's a lot of controversy around um, climate change impacts of bioenergy. I explained how you remove the CO2 from the atmosphere and then you emit it again at the end. Of course, we don't live in a perfect world. And there's all sorts of inefficiencies and different things that happen along that supply chain that mean that actually we've consumed energy here, we've used the material here, which means that we've emitted something to the atmosphere at some point. So it's quite challenging to actually um, try to evaluate what the impact of a unit of electricity, heat, transport fuel actually is. And Manchester um, really specialise in that. So one of the areas that we um, lead in within the hub is on the greenhouse gas balances of energy systems. The second thing that we really, um, is our forte here in Manchester, is integration of the different components of sustainability. So when we talk about things being sustainable, I think most of us have a vague notion that it's all fluffy bunnies and sounds nice and it's environmentally friendly. Academically, we like to be a wee bit more rigorous, so we talk about sustainability having an economic, an environmental and a social component. So it's drawn out as a triangle with those three things at the corner. And what Manchester is very, very good at is taking that climate work and the greenhouse gas balances for a system and then saying, OK, that's the GHG bit done. But what about the rest of the environment? Are there trade-offs here? And you often find with bioenergy there is. So a system that's great for greenhouse gas emissions might be totally dreadful 
for land use and eutrophication and other impacts that can be quite damaging to crops and to people. So that's the environmental dimension, but then you've got to also look at the economic and the social. And we've done a lot of work here looking at how we um, support jobs along the supply chain, what the contribution to GDP is and how sustainable um, the industry would be in the future. And we've also done a lot of work looking at the um, social aspects. This is particularly important when we're looking at developing countries where we're developing new social structures as the energy demands grow and the energy infrastructure is evolving along with that. So you're looking at um, trying to work out who am I needing to be in my supply chain? Which farmers are needed? Do I need to have new sets of jobs focused around lorry driving? and what is the impact if I use this biomass material to provide heat locally in a village where they can use it for drying grain so that it will stay um, fresher for longer and we'll be able to improve the, well, we'll be able to reduce the amount of food wasted. What's the impact if we use it for refrigeration purposes or if we use it to provide electricity so people can have mobile phones and iPads in the evening. So. There's a lot of different things that you can think of as your sustainability impacts and there's trade-offs between those. The thing that will give you the best GHG reductions might not give you the best across all of the other parameters. Mm -hmm.